Shanvi, Avinash, we are good? Yeah, all good. Yeah. All right, lovely. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, June edition of the Riva Patel Postgraduate Lecture Series. We uh, are at the outset, I would like to first thank Dr. Avinash D'Souza. Uh, this was originally a lecture planned by Dr. Sidney. Unfortunately, he is stuck in Manipur and they have a internet ban in Manipur right now because of the current uh, situation. And uh, so he had to beg out of it at the last moment and Dr. D'Souza was so gracious as to fill in for him at the very last minute. And uh, it was quite a rush for him, but uh, he was kind enough to accommodate us. So we are really grateful to him for that. And of course, uh, Janvi uh, very graciously decided to continue being the moderator for this session. And uh, we're grateful to her that she's also been so open-minded and accommodating. And it's because of the benevolence and the, the, the goodness of people like them that you know we have been able to continue conducting these programs and uh, uh, being popular with the postgraduate students and now, of course, many senior faculty as well. Uh, it gives me great pleasure in introducing Dr. Janvi. I have uh, known Dr. Janvi Kedare since my postgraduate days. She was my registrar in Nair at the Department of Psychiatry and uh, uh, she's been a very dear friend and a teacher for me. Uh, 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 by the virtue of the fact that I was her houseman, she was my registrar. She has uh, uh, since uh, been with uh, Nair Hospital uh, in teaching capacity. Uh, she is currently the additional professor of psychiatry, the department of psychiatry at Nair Hospital. Geriatric psychiatry, community psychiatry, ethics and research uh, are her current interests where she is uh, doing a lot of good work. Uh, she is uh, also the current president of the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Committee uh, at the TN Medical College in Nair Hospital. She is a member secretary of the Institutional Ethics Committee at Nair Hospital. Uh, she has been uh, she is the co-chair of Clinical Practice Guidelines Subcommittee of the Indian Psychiatric Society. She is the chairperson of the Awards Committee of the Indian Institute of Geriatric Mental Health. Uh, in the Association of Geriatric Mental Health, I beg your pardon. Uh, she has been the past president of the Bombay Psychiatric Society. She has been the past honorary secretary of the Indian Association for Geriatric Mental Health uh, in 2014 and 16. Past honorary secretary of the Bombay Psychiatric Society. She has well over 35, 40 publications uh, to her credit. She is involved in various public awareness programs through newspapers and magazine articles and radio and television programs. And she is a very warm and a very, very uh, uh, nice human being. And uh, I feel privileged to call her uh, a friend. And uh, I'm going to pass on from one good friend to another. I will request Dr. Janvi to take over the proceedings and introduce Dr. Avinash D'Souza to you and uh, take the evening session forward. Thank over you. to you, Janvi. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmin. Thank you for your kind words. and. Uh... Yes, Avinash is a troubleshooter, no doubt about it. And as usual, he has decided to help out Rashmin in this crisis. And of course, uh, as Rashmin is thankful to you, so am I. It's always a great pleasure to moderate a session where you are speaking. And so, of course, when Rashmin asked me if I would continue to moderate, there was no question of saying no. And yes, of course, I accepted. And I'm sure Avinash actually doesn't need an introduction. He is a dynamic leader in the field of mental health, not only in Mumbai, but also but all over the country. And he's a prolific speaker. He's a consultant psychiatrist and founder trustee of the Souza Foundation, Mumbai. He is a consultant in HN Reliance Hospital. He is a research associate in uh, Lokman Network Medical College in Sion Hospital and we can see that he has about 850 research publications and various chapters. And uh, I know that he is associated with teaching in psychology and other specialties of mental health profession also, and has been associated with many organizations in the field of mental health, uh, has been associated with school mental health since many years. And 
Uh, he's an excellent speaker in psychiatry on various subjects. Trauma is one of them. Trauma is not very easy to handle and not very easy to talk about either. Because beginning with the definition of trauma, one wonders what is meant by trauma? What are the effects of trauma? Is it just limited to acute stress reaction or to PTSD? Or does it lead to varied psychiatric disorders later on in life? There is so much research on early childhood trauma that gives rise to a range of psychopathologies in adulthood and in childhood. I think it would be really interesting to listen to Avinash and to know the whole gamut of psychiatric disorders and the various psychological effects trauma can have on an individual. So I think Avinash, over to you and I'm sure people are very keen to listen to you. Yeah, I just run my slides and uh, I'll take over. Just uh, keep them full, keep, make this full screen, Nitish, the, the slide, please. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, the topic today is a very interesting one because uh, it is more broad based. I uh, am not going to speak purely about PTSD, as many people may think. Uh, I'm going to speak about trauma in general because... I think uh, whether you work in a medical college hospital or whether you work in a private setting, you're going to see patients that have undergone some form of trauma. And we're not talking about injury-based trauma, which is physical, but we're talking about psychological injury over here. And what's, what's very important is that, uh, uh, Nitesh, you will not change slides till I tell you to change. Okay. So what's, what's very important is that the reason we are going to speak here about trauma is from a psychiatric resident's perspective, certain things that you should know, certain things that you should be aware of, uh, the sensitivity, the empathy, the importance of dealing with these patients in your day-to-day -day practice. Uh, I'm sure it will be helpful to you later on also if you opt for private practice, but more so at a residency level and uh, as a learner in psychiatry, what you should know. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by trauma? And we're talking here first of individual trauma. When I mean individual trauma, it is trauma that happens to a single person. Individual trauma can result from an event. Means it could be one event. It could be a series of events. That is, multiple things could happen. Or it could be a set of circumstances. So there could be things around you which are traumatic. It may not happen to you, but there are things around you which are traumatic. And is experienced by an individual as both physically or emotionally harmful and life-threatening. This is very, very important that always remember the word life-threatening is or. It is not and. So a lot of people think that if the trauma was not life-threatening, it was not a major trauma. That's not the case. It could be circumstances which you are experiencing, events which could be harmful. They may be life-threatening. But it has lasting adverse effects on an individual's functioning. And when we mean functioning, it is physical well-being, mental well-being, social well-being, emotional well-being, and even spiritual well-being. A lot of people post-trauma change even spiritually, socially, physically, not only just at a mental and an emotional level. Next slide. So why is trauma important? Whenever you get patients who visit they will probably speak about trauma in different ways. They will tell you that either they'll tell you, I've had incidences in my life which have been traumatic. I've had incidences at a childhood level or at an adolescent level which have been traumatic. I've had a series of events in my life which have been traumatic. They may also tell you about an ongoing trauma that has led them to seek a psychiatric consultation. It can also happen that... Uh, the trauma is ongoing, but they don't even at times realize it is traumatic. They think it is very normal for those things to happen. So 
there are many people who come to you and tell you that i've had a bad childhood where a parent hit me physically abused me i was neglected and i felt it was very normal because as a parent that person had the right to do it i never even thought that this was traumatic it's only now when i have read about trauma that i realized that i have been through trauma in my life now trauma is something which is a highly individualistic event so for example let's say i undergo a road accident and i come out of it and i'm emotionally fit and fine and there's no problem i may have just hurt my hand but i may come out of it absolutely fine but there are people who might be emotionally spiritually mentally harmed by that event so it's highly individualistic one person might react to it in a different way one person may react to it in another way so we cannot say that my trauma is bigger than yours your trauma is smaller than mine we both have undergone the same kind of trauma it is highly highly individualistic in all aspects secondly please remember that trauma can't be quantified you may have rating scales for trauma the intensity of the trauma etc etc but trauma can never ever be quantified the reason being that why trauma can't be quantified for a very very simple reason it's psychological it's emotional it's individualistic for example let's say two women undergo rape can i quantify and say that this woman's trauma is more than the other no we can't it's highly individualistic and it's highly emotional and it's highly qualitative we can rate trauma and rate improvement yes but we can't quantify trauma next slide next i think yeah so trauma has a series of effects now if you look at this slide always remember trauma can lead to symptoms trauma can lead to situations trauma can lead to disorders so if someone undergoes trauma as you can see i'm starting at a 12 o'clock clock position you can have nightmares and flashbacks so you get up in the middle of the night sweating thinking about what happened or while you're working the day you have repeated memories of what happened you can have intrusive memories repeated memories that come and worry you you can have a heightened startled response that you're sitting you're doing your work suddenly you, the bell rings and you get startled someone comes and says hello and you get startled trauma can also lead to shame you feel how the hell did i get into that situation how did i become so weak a hatred for the self can develop panic attacks can happen and panic disorder can happen post trauma you have a lot of people who get emotionally overwhelmed there are chronic pains a lot of people develop headache back ache arthritis neck ache all sorts of pains post trauma some people can develop an eating disorder post trauma so you develop either anorexia bulimia obesity binge eating all kinds of problems can happen to cope with the trauma someone might take to substance abuse so you can take to cannabis use you can take to alcohol use you can take to nicotine use there are others who might result uh, take to non suicidal self injury or self destructive behaviors cutting themselves harming themselves which is their coping for the trauma there are some who go into a denial mode and there's little or no memory of the trauma that happens there are some who get hyper vigilant any any sensation on the body makes them hyper vigilant there are some who get dissociated they might develop possession states they may develop dissociative symptoms depression as a disorder can happen post trauma some get irritability and anger some just develop a general loss of interest in everything you will have a lot of patients who will come and tell you doctor i feel numb don't think it's just a passing symptom it's a very serious symptom in psychiatry when people say that they are numb they say we don't experience any emotion even happiness doesn't give us happiness insomnia is very important symptom you may have decreased attention and focus which is bound to happen and hopelessness that goes with the depression so trauma can cause symptoms trauma can cause a disorder trauma can cause multiple facets all of this may occur in the same patient some of this may occur in the same patient or one of these may occur in the same patient next slide 
So what are the types of trauma? The trauma, of course, could be physical, whether it's bodily harm. The emotional trauma could be response to a disturbing event or situation. So let's say you see some abuse happening. You see a rape happening. You see a murder happening. You see riots happening. You see a bomb blast happening. It could be a response to a situation. Domestic violence, for that matter. Acute emotional trauma is when the response is seen directly. You see it immediately within an hour, within a few minutes, within by in a few hours. Chronic is when there's long term. And it is from repeated prolonged events that happen. And complex trauma is response to multiple events. So somebody may have been through physical abuse when he was young, bullying when he was in college, traumatic relationships as he grew up, a traumatic marriage. So complex trauma responses can happen when there are multiple traumas that happen. Next slide. So there are four requirements that have to be met for the brain to perceive, that is you perceive and encode, register that event as a trauma. One, an event has to happen. You have to have seen something, observed something, been in something. The event does not have to be life-threatening. Very important. Meaning, the event must have a significant meaning to the person. So it should be linked to a potential loss of attachment like relationship status or maybe life itself. Landscape. The brain and its neural landscape must be vulnerable to traumatization. Not everybody develops post-traumatic symptoms. But there is a brain neural landscape. If I've been through repeated trauma, stress, I already have anxiety, I already have depression, I already have some other symptoms. The neural landscape of my brain is more vulnerable to traumatization. Also, the event must be perceived as inescapable. Inescapability. The person should realize I can't get out of this situation. So these requirements are very important for an event to be encoded and perceived as being traumatic. Next slide. So you get a lot of patients that come to you with unhealed trauma. They'll say that I've had a lot of trauma, but now I've never sought treatment for it. When someone has unhealed trauma, it can exist in different ways. One, the person would be overtly agreeable. He may say yes to everything in his life because he doesn't want anything to go wrong. He may resist a positive change. Anyone showing love to him, he runs away. Anyone showing affection to him, he runs away. There may be a low sense of self-worth. He may feel I am good for nothing, I am hopeless, no one loves me. He may always try to help other people and put his needs on aside. There is a codependency in relationships. He is always looking for validity. There is always dependence on the partner. He doesn't want to be alone. They may have a difficulty in standing up for themselves and asserting boundaries. They crave for external validation and this could be people. This could also be on social media. They are also not able to tolerate any conflict. So any conflict happens, they immediately say sorry and want to you know, accept that okay, it's my fault. They have a fear of being abandoned. In psychiatry, we see a lot of patients with anxiety and depression who show this. We see a lot of patients with borderline personality that show a fear of being abandoned. They also may have a difficulty in tolerating abusive behaviors from others. So whenever anything abusive happens, they get upset, they may cry, and they live with an innate feeling of shame and unhappiness. They, all these features, I mean, a lot of unhealed trauma very often leads to personality changes and can result in a personality disorder. And we very often see a lot of patients with borderline personality, histrionic personality, narcissistic personality, for that matter, some cases of antisocial personality that have had unhealed trauma in their lives. Next slide. A very important component is unhealed childhood trauma. And this is something we've already undergone, but you have a lot of people who will come to you for treatment in adulthood when they are 18 or when they are 25 or when they are 30. And they'll talk about unhealed childhood trauma. So the person may be people-pleasing. There may be codependency. There's a fear of abandonment like we already discussed. There may be a difficulty in setting boundaries. They might constantly be, you know, uh, unable to decide how much, how close to be with people. 
they may tolerate abusive behavior they may think it's very normal for this to happen they may ignore their own needs like we already spoke they fall for narcissistic people they have attachment issues and they also probably take to substances so this is one shade similar to what we discussed in the previous slide next slide now whenever one undergoes a traumatic event in dsm we talk of two conditions acute stress disorder and post traumatic stress disorder the differences between these conditions are important to know the onset in acute stress disorder is 0 to 28 days after the trauma occurs in ptsd at least 1 month after the trauma occurs the duration in acute stress disorder is between 3 days to 4 weeks but ptsd could last 1 month and persist for several years the symptoms in acute stress disorder are more based on depersonalization and derealization depersonalization is when you feel that the self is changing derealization is when you feel that the world is changing and there may be avoidance heightened awareness changes in mood and cognition and ptsd generally in acute stress disorder some medication short term psychotherapy works and the patient comes out of it in post traumatic stress disorder there's a long term therapy needed emdr yoga relaxation mindfulness and medication may also be needed it's important to note that some cases with acute stress disorder can develop a post traumatic stress pattern and continue in the long run next slide in post traumatic stress disorder it always occurs after a traumatic event happens but what is a crisis situation when someone develops non suicidal self injurious behavior it's an eye opener we have to attack and we have to treat immediately if a patient is suicidal in the ptsd phase we have to treat immediately a lot of patients can develop psychosis after trauma a lot of patients take to substance use after trauma now what is very important to understand is trauma as a whole a traumatic event as a whole can result in the genesis of any psychiatric condition so let's say we take 100 people that experience the same traumatic event 10 may develop depression 10 may develop anxiety 10 may take to substance abuse 10 may develop non suicidal self injury 10 may be suicidal 10 might develop psychosis 10 might have dissociation so different disorders can result from the same trauma and one thing which i would want to tell every resident is every patient that comes to you please ask for a history of child sexual abuse it's very very common in my practice i ask every patient about the history of childhood trauma and childhood sexual abuse specifically and the rates of this are alarming there was a study done in 2017 or i think 2015 by the ministry of health and family welfare in india that showed 46% of children in the country have undergone some trauma in their childhood not necessarily sexual abuse but 46% we're looking at half our children so it's very important that we ask any adult patient that comes to you any adolescent that comes to you about trauma a person can experience one event that has a lifetime impact yes a single event like say a rape can have a lifetime impact a single event like a near death experience a failed relationship can have a lifetime impact for another person you can have the impact of trauma built up through traumatic events like child sexual abuse child sexual abuse differs from every other traumatic event only for two reasons one it's repetitive not many traumatic events are repetitive you don't get into an accident twice you don't get into a rape situation daily child sexual abuse can happen daily for many many months and what's also very important is it happens with someone who's close to the person invariably it's normal for people to have a negative reaction after a traumatic event but we do diagnose ptsd in many cases PTSD in India is a little less common than it's in the West. For those of you who may not be aware, we've had train blasts in India, we've had riots in India, we've had bomb blasts, and the next day the city of Mumbai has been back to work. There were some studies done that assessed PTSD in these victims in the nineties. There were some studies done after the train blasts, but 
the rates of PTSD were far lower than those found in the London metro train blasts versus the Indian blasts. I don't know, maybe Indians are more resilient. We have far, far, far more priorities. So sometimes we don't undergo post-traumatic symptoms. Next slide. So generally, how do I decide about diagnosing PTSD? So if I have a traumatic event, was it a threat to life or was it a physical trauma? Yes. Then trauma exposure. I look at whether I directly witnessed it, was it indirect? Was it, you know, look at the details. Do I meet the symptom criteria as per DSM? Is the duration criteria met? Is there distress? Then I diagnose PTSD. If any one of these are no, then of course I don't diagnose PTSD. So you can have acute stress disorder, you can have acute PTSD, chronic PTSD, and sometimes PTSD can occur with an onset as late as six months post the trauma, which is called delayed onset PTSD. This graphic will give you a perfect example. Next slide. So what is the natural history of PTSD? Generally, the traumatic event happens. The onset of symptoms is usually within a month. Many recover without treatment within months or years of the event. In around 9 to 10 months to 11 months, they recover. 45 to 80% natural remission happens at 9 months. But around 33% remain symptomatic for 3 years or longer with a greater risk of secondary problems. So you need to treat trauma when it happens. We cannot not treat it. Next slide. A very important factor for people to know is a term called trauma bonding. Trauma bonding is a cycle of physical or emotional abuse that creates a strong attachment between an abused person, a person who's undergoing abuse and their abuser, reinforced by periods of love and affection and then periods of devaluation and emotional abuse. So you may have some periods where there's a lot of love and affection between the two. Then there are periods where there are fights and you begin to feel, oh, he's not such a bad person. It was just that this was a bad evening. This was a bad day. It was a bad week. And they come back to liking each other. And that is what is known as trauma bonding because they don't want to get out of a relationship which is toxic. They want to remain in that relationship. Next slide. So there are different types of trauma bonds. And this is very, very essential because a lot of patients talk about this. Abandonment, a feeling of never knowing where you stand. A lot of people feel that they, if they do anything wrong, the person will leave them and go. So they are, these are what are called push-pull dynamics. The person may feel not being chosen, not being, being left out. The second type is fawning, where a partner takes on another partner's identity. And it can happen that, you know, he might behave as though he's the other person. This can happen sometimes in some relationships. There's emotional neglect, of course. And there's also a lot of control. Relationship is a roller coaster relationship where one partner is dominant, the other is submissive, and there is a huge amount of control. Next. How does trauma affect the brain? So when we have a structure in our brain was the amygdala. Everyone knows that it's the fear center of our brain. So when the amygdala identifies a potential threat, it sounds the alarm. This alarm activates the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system then is like a gas pedal. So it releases stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. The body goes into a state of fight or flight. You all know this. And it causes several psychological changes to the body and brain. So we all know the stress response which Han Sele gave us. And that's what happens when the amygdala gets the alarm. Next slide. Trauma can affect the brain in a number of ways. So a lot of people ask me whether trauma affects the brain structurally or functionally, both ways. So you have memories which are created. These are suppressed memories through learning. And the brain creates these memories during emotional states. The memories became, become blocked only when the person revisits the traumatic event does the memory come to the fore. So a short-term memory loss can in fact be a coping mechanism for the brain to prevent one from remembering or reliving the traumatic event. That's why they avoid anything associated with the event. They avoid talking about it. They avoid speaking about it. They avoid describing it. They may even deny the event actually happened. So this can happen that, you know, a short-term memory loss happens. This is due to hippocampal mechanisms. Next slide. So we have three main structures involved in trauma. One is the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory and differentiating between the past and present. 
This is important because it has to remember and make sense of the trauma. With consistent repeated exposure to trauma, the hippocampus shrinks. The amygdala is wired for survival. The more hyperactive the amygdala is, the more we have signs of PTSD. And the prefrontal cortex, which is rational in its thinking, it regulates emotions such as the fear response from the amygdala. And in patients with PTSD, the prefrontal cortex has reduced work compared to patients that don't have PTSD. Next slide. So trauma can also alter the structure of the brain. We already described this. The hippocampus shrinks. The area which becomes overactive is the amygdala. The ventromedial prefrontal cortex may shrink. And it's the area which is responsible for mood and regulation. That's why depression, anxiety all occurs. What's very important is it causes higher order functioning, like problem solving, to become under functioning. And when it becomes under functioning, it from defensive, one becomes overactive. Next slide. So this is a PET scan, which will talk about a healthy brain on the left and an abused brain on the right. The PET scan on the left is the brain of a normal child and it shows the regions of high, that is red and low, that is blue and black activity. At birth, only primitive structures such as the brain stem, etc. are functional and the temporal lobes, etc. I mean, early childhood experiences via these circuits. On the right, you have an abused brain, which is the PET scan of a Romanian orphan who was institutionalized shortly after birth and there was extreme deprivation, affectional deprivation in infancy. The temporal lobes which regulate emotions are nearly quiescent and they are quiet. So such children suffer from emotional and cognitive problems. So trauma does affect the brain structurally and functionally, both. Next slide. Trauma permanently changes us. There is no doubt about it. This is the big and scary truth about trauma. There's no such thing as getting over it. The five stages of grief model marks the universal stages in learning to accept loss. But the reality is in fact much, much bigger. A major life disruption leaves a new normal in its wake. There is no back to the old me. We're different. Full stop. This is not a negative thing. Healing from trauma would also mean finding new strength and joy. The goal of healing is not a papering over the edges. It is to acknowledge and wear your new life, the warts, the wisdom and everything with a lot of courage. Next slide. There's also something called generational trauma. So you can have grandparents who have been part of an India-Pakistan war, an India-Bangladesh war, extreme poverty, etc. The parents have gone through alcoholism, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and approval-seeking identity, eating disorder, etc. in the children. So this is called trauma that occurs across generations. It is a little different from another term which I'll introduce. This is when generations of the same family experience trauma. Next slide. Then we have something called intergenerational trauma, trauma that gets transferred from one generation to the other. So someone who experiences trauma can have lifelong effects Effects like anxiety, shame, etc. And the person, when they have children, they can impact them. Patients, um, parents may develop a negative, neglectful, authoritative style. The child develops trauma and this trauma can then, of course, be later uh, passed on from one generation to the other. So this is the phenomenon of intergenerational trauma. Next slide. So this is the curve of change in trauma. In trauma, there are a large number of curves. I'm going to just take you through some of them because this is not given in your textbook and this is something that you should know. So as we have initially shock, denial, fear, frustration, all that happens, then the acceptance comes in. And then after that, with hope, engagement and creativity, a new normal sets in. Next slide. We all have been through COVID-19. We all have been through some disasters and this is, disasters have also been linked to trauma. So pre-disaster, there is a warning, there's a threat, there's an impact. And in the initial phase, the entire community comes together, which is the heroic phase. And there is what is called community cohesion, which is the honeymoon phase of the disaster. Then slowly, people start crumbling and disillusionment happens. Following that, recovery happens, but then there are anniversary reactions. Anniversary reactions are things that happen at one year. You might have anger, grief, multiple things that can happen. 
and slowly there's a reconstruction. COVID is definitely, I think, in some way a collective trauma that a lot of people have been through. It's changed people. It's changed personalities. There's no doubt about it. Next slide. This I'm not going to go into. We already went through this. The slides are there for you all to keep. I mean, please feel free. Whoever is the organizers can distribute the slides to the residents. Next slide. So this is Elizabeth kubler Ross's stages of acceptance of change. There's shock. There's denial. There's awareness that the trauma happens. There's acceptance. Then after that, you deal with your new reality. There's experimentation, searching, and integration. So there's seven stages here, just like you have the stages of grief. This was also given by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross itself. Next slide. So you have different forms of psychotherapy. Each of this is a separate lecture. I'm not going to go into this. It's just for you to know. There's a huge school of CBT that looks at trauma-focused CBT. So you have exposure therapy, cognitive therapy, cognitive processing therapy that is used. You use narratives. You also use behavioral techniques. Then there's stress inoculation training. So muscle relaxation, breathing, role-playing, self-talk, thought-stopping, yoga, etc. And EMDR, eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, which is a therapy. I don't have much idea about it because I don't practice it. But there are psychiatrists and psychologists who are trained in this and they work in this for trauma. Next slide. So generally, just from a pharmacological point of view, I'm not going to go into which drug for what. It's important that you diagnose, you treat the causes, you treat, give medication, but not for a long-term period. Medication can be given for six months to two years or three years. Sometimes you need long-term medication. You have to give symptom-based treatment when it comes to trauma. So you see what the symptom is. You see whether an antidepressant is needed, whether a benzodiazepine is needed, whether you need a, a mood stabilizer, and then you decide. Next slide. So even in times of trauma, we try to maintain a sense of normality until we no longer can. That is called surviving, not healing. We never become whole again. We are survivors. If you're here today, you're a survivor. But those who have made it through hell and are still standing, we bear a different name called warriors, not survivors. Next slide. Life has taught me that I'm not always in control. It's full of experiences, lessons, heartbreak, and pain. But it has also shown me love, beauty, the possibility of new beginnings. Embrace it all. It makes us who we are. And always remember, after every storm comes a clear sky. Next slide. This is my last slide, and I tell all my patients this. Your trauma is valid. Even if other people have experienced worse. Even if someone else who went through the same experience doesn't feel debilitated by it, even if it could have been avoided, it's valid. Even if it happened a long time ago, it's valid. Even if no one knows, it's valid. Your trauma is real and valid and you deserve a space to talk about it. You're not being desperate or pathetic or attention-seeking. It's self-care. It's unconceivably brave. And regardless of the magnitude of your struggle, you're allowed to take care of yourself by processing and unloading the pain you carry in therapy. Your pain matters, your experience matters, your healing matters. Nothing, no one can take that away. This is by Daniel Kupke, who's a trauma therapist. Next slide. So trauma is a fact of life. It does not, however, have to be a life sentence. Thank you so much. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash. That was really a comprehensive review of what is meant by trauma, the uh, interface between the psychological factors and the uh, neural sciences, especially the neuroanatomical and functional findings in trauma and various presentations of trauma. Uh, you touched briefly upon the kind of therapies that can be offered and uh, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions. Uh, uh, many of raised... the itself, you know, I mean, we cannot try and cover everything. I uh, agree. Yeah. It can be just an introduction in one lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise we will have to take a course on trauma. 
and at the moment it's not possible uh, somebody had raised a hand so i will invite that person to ask the question let me see who it is i think it's shalini ananta would you like to ask a question shalini yes please yes uh, please yes please i'm on a train so it's a little noisy i'm sorry about that um, no issue Go I, ahead. first of all I want to thank Dr. Avinash for taking up such an important topic and uh, summarizing it in this short duration also. I just had one question that while uh, Dr. Avinash was saying that it is a very individualistic approach, uh, individualistic thing, you know, who gets affected by what event or lack of an event which we call neglect. Uh, then at the same time, when we are able to divided into yes or no that you know if there was an event no then no PTSD if there was this no then no PTSD so then how do we decide when we can uh, say that it is an individualistic thing and when we can divide it in terms of this kind of a table well uh, we have criteria ma'am primarily so that you know there is a standardization in diagnosis but it doesn't mean that, you know, the person who doesn't meet the criteria has not undergone trauma. It just means that they've undergone trauma, but probably don't have PTSD as a disorder. They may still need help therapeutically, medically for, you know, whatever they're undergoing. It's just that they do not meet criteria for PTSD. So the trauma does need help anyway. I mean, I'm not saying because it's no in certain things. We Just because we don't diagnose PTSD, we don't treat. We very often treat patients with symptoms who may not fit into the boxes of DSM. But we still have to treat them. Yeah, I think what the point Avinash has made through the lecture is that every trauma needs healing. And that healing comes through various ways. Uh, may may not require medicines all the time. But that healing is important. And that is why he showed us the process of going through the trauma and how the trauma can be accepted in life. I think that is uh, what is important. There is uh, one more question, Avinash, that uh, which drug do you commonly use for PTSD and what dose? So I think it depends again on, on your choice and based on the symptoms of the patient. So if you have more emotional symptoms, you can start with an SSRI. If you feel there are more mood, attention, focus, motivational kind of symptoms, you might look at an SNRI. If you feel sleep is an issue, then you'll have to give an antidepressant along with a benzodiazepine or an antidepressant that could also induce sleep. So it depends. So there are multiple choices. There's no fixed drug. I think I decide based on symptom profile, you know, rather than probably uh, saying that this is a drug that can be used. True. Very true. Uh, Dr. Chaitanya has asked how often psychosis is seen after trauma. So I think psychosis, I would put it at between 5 to 7% of people. And I think what's very important is whether they have a genetic history of schizophrenia or psychosis, whether uh, there is, you know, uh, the personality is prone, you know, to psychosis. So generally what happens is you may have a patient that has a borderline personality configuration that's formed after trauma and they undergo what are called micropsychotic episodes that you see in borderline personality. And when a major trauma happens again in their life, sometimes they might break down into a full-blown psychosis. So that can happen. So there are multiple reasons why psychosis happens. But on an average, 5%, depression, anxiety, panic attacks are far more common. So I think the neural landscape that you spoke about is very important. The biological vulnerability, in a way, decides the kind of uh, normality yes, the patient support. may develop. Also Pardon? Pardon? Yes, social support and family support also Oh, matters. yes, of course. Social support also matters. Uh, there is one more question for you. Uh, Dr. Prashant Jain. Okay, he has added a comment that it also depends on coping. Yes. Which is a fact that, yes, it does depend on coping. Uh, okay, any other questions? I think what is important is that in our day-to-day -day practice, uh, as a resident while working in a teaching hospital, or once you start your private, uh, where we lack is our inquiry into the history of trauma. Means, I think we need to be a little more proactive in asking about trauma when we know that uh, uh, trauma is experienced by almost everybody. 
say even even me i am sure some traumatic experience we have always had we all, all of us have had and that needs processing and therefore it is uh, important that we know uh, note the history okay uh, once again shalini anant has said that i am wondering if most people pretend to themselves and others that they are staying enough to cope how do we assess if they are actually able to cope well i think from their symptoms the way they present in therapy when you speak to them you'll realize over time with experience that you know someone is able to cope well or not cope well and those that don't cope well often break down at some point of time so i think that's a relatively good marker yeah very true uh yes anybody else does anybody else want to ask questions any question this is a very complex uh, topic because yes medico legally speaking we keep seeing patients of poxo sexual offences domestic violence we think more in terms of legality when we see these patients i think what is important is not just to be able to rule out psychiatric morbidity in them but uh, basically also to see the effect of trauma uh, not just as a psychiatric disorder but on the psyche of the patient uh another question has come up what do we suggest for preparedness for trauma that's a good question preparedness for trauma i think uh, it's 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 a very difficult question because uh, you know how 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 many types of trauma are we going to prepare them for so we can only generally make them you know resilient like i remember in a school one week ago when we did like a resilience building workshop uh i mean one of the teachers told me what if the child goes out and has a road accident tomorrow how is he prepared for it and i said i can't prepare him for everything in life i can only prepare him for a general attitude that okay if this happens this is how you cope he may still not be able to cope with everything so it doesn't mean that uh, we can i mean there's nothing like total trauma preparedness i think we can just prepare them in general like for example if we know that my my city is more prone to hurricanes we prepare them you know for that and the trauma that might happen or if i know that a particular problem is more prone in my city i can prepare them that way but obviously you can never prepare anyone for every, every trauma like now if someone is in a marriage i can't prepare them you know what if divorce will happen i mean but when divorce is not happening they may not have the till set to be ready to prepare for it so so you can't prepare them for every trauma you can just in general prepare them yes and make them tougher and strong and tell them be cohesive be together but beyond that no but again after all that how they may behave at that very moment is very difficult to decide true i think the question has uh, come from the concept of disaster preparedness yeah, yeah, yeah. in which we do talk about a lot of strategies and as you said ultimately building resilience to face anything trauma or otherwise is uh, more important uh, than being specifically prepared for a specific kind of trauma uh well i think uh, you have covered the main issues of trauma very well in the lecture uh, there is one more comment okay a question again comment on suicide and trauma well i think uh, i already covered that there are two aspects one is you can have frank suicidal behavior or you can have non suicidal self injury both happen and i think frank suicidal behavior happens more when they see no road ahead so i mean you may have some rape victims who after a trauma can you know because of the shame do that you may have people because of the stigma of having to you know undergo everything can do that but there are a lot of i think suicide is a little less common post trauma because they are very very vulnerable and they are more help seeking in that phase but non suicidal self injury as a coping mechanism in the long run is i mean far more common according to me and at least i have seen that far more in my practice and uh, uh, they believe that it's the reason is most patients tell you it's one form of pain to get over the other kind of pain you know that's their whole mechanism i substitute one pain with another so it's a wrong coping sure. mechanism not something that we advise yes just to add to this and uh, not an effect of trauma but how suicide in family can cause trauma to survivors that is 
family members, friends, means they say that one suicide can lead to uh, psychological effects on so many others surround, uh, around that person. From that point of view also, it can become traumatic, definitely. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Chaitanya, Shalini Ananta, uh, Raj, uh, all of them who asked questions have thanked you, Avinash. Uh, you also may be able to see in the chat box. I think that was a wonderful lecture. And uh, I think, Rashmin, we can wind up. What do you suggest? Sure. Thank you. With your permission, I'd like to punch in a couple of questions. As oh, well. yes, yeah, sure, sure. What is the role of steroids in the management of uh, <laughs> trauma? That's one thing. And, and there's something called first aid for trauma, you know, that golden hour. Do you have any comments about that, Avinash? Well, I think uh, first aid, yes. I mean, uh, we have a lot of workshops on first aid that we conduct. So it, it is something that, yes, does play a role. In fact, even... Uh, First aid, post-trauma and first aid, you know, preparation before trauma, both psychological first aid workshops definitely, definitely play a role. Uh, with regard to the role of steroids per se, uh, well, there are two theories. One is that during trauma and when one undergoes trauma, A, there is an immense release of corticosteroids and other things that happen. So corticosteroid antagonists are now being, you know, looked at as probably drug mechanisms to work in PTSD and other things, but they've not yet sort of been tried. Uh, we've had a few trials, but not with any major responses. The second thing also is that uh, mechanisms that would reduce cortisol release, like yoga, relaxation, mindfulness, etc. are being looked at as mechanisms to sort of treat trauma. So I think that would be my take. Biologically, I cannot comment much on the neurosteroid hypothesis. I'm not much read in that area. There was a study way back when we were just soon after post graduation that they would actually administer five milligrams of prednisolone to people who yeah. would be exposed to trauma, say for example, a road traffic accident or a bomb blast or something like that. You know, so any kind of a calamity, and uh, they found that some of them probably did not develop symptoms of acute stress disorder or PTSD even for the simple reason that that coding of the trauma-related event did not happen as robustly. Of course, this was not, unfortunately, replicated in larger studies. These were some very, very sporadic trials and anecdotal case reports and stuff like that. But that was something which was very interesting. So that was something like a chemical first aid as well, where you immediately intervene. But then that was where the concept of the golden hour for trauma treatment and management came in, just the way you have it for cardiac or stroke cases. I think one yeah. of the uh, caveats in this would be that uh, how many people will reach us within golden hours? Yeah. So, in, so, yeah, after experiencing a traumatic event, how many people actually seek help is the question. You know? That's 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 a million dollar question. But I think we've been struggling with the same question for cardiac cases, cases with stroke as yeah. well. So uh, ironically, this is easier. You don't have to uh, put in uh, a thrombolytic agents or uh, yeah. spend them or whatever, they just have to pop a pill. So this will obviously require a lot more detailed study and some of the subsequent studies debunk this theory, but I don't think it has been pursued long enough. So maybe that's something that's interesting and we can look at. Uh, so another, another thing is the personality types uh, with regard to trauma. Which types are more uh, likely to indulge in self-injurious behavior uh, and uh, perceive trauma differently and uh, which of them may overreact to any event and perceive it as trauma when it is just a regular stressful event. Because one man's uh, uh, problem is not another man's problem as well. So it's, it's a subjective thing. So I think any comments about that, Avinash? No, I think I mentioned that that it's you know highly individualistic, and I think mm -hmm. what what also happens is that uh, uh, it's it's very difficult. I mean, you know, it's wrong for us to say that you know the event is not traumatic enough. I mentioned. I mean, I said if it is traumatic enough for the individual who's gone through it, it's it's traumatic enough. I mean, I wouldn't want to tell him no. It's not such a major event, you know, in your life, and you're making a big deal about it. No, I wouldn't want to you know get into that realm. I'll be, you know, very happy to treat him as though he's undergone trauma. I mean, that would be my thinking. 
because i mean i can never really get into his shoes and understand what he's feeling like i mean it's a very i'll give you an example it's like parental loss some people you know are very affected by it and you find some people and they'll say i never really was attached to my dad so i wasn't affected but then uh, and you know when you look at other people they're so affected so now their personal relationship or equation with the person is something that we cannot judge about you know i had a patient the other day who came and told me that his cousin uh his uh, maternal uncle expired and he was very affected by it now he was close to this person now you know i might if i look at myself say, okay i'm not so attached to my maternal uncle i mean i would feel sad i would feel bad but i would not look at it as a major trauma but then for him it was so i can't tell him ki you know abhi your father has not died it's only your maternal uncle that has died i mean it's highly individualistic for the person concerned so we'll have to go with what he feels no true that obviously it is not uh, one size fits all kind of a solution yeah. but uh, uh, the perception of trauma uh, is also not stereotype per se but it can be classified into certain larger groups based on which we can probably have more uh, specifically tailored uh, uh, coping mechanisms or a treatment approach so i was speaking more in the context of that but nonetheless your point is very taken and every case is a individual case and we have to give them the due uh, respect that they deserve and the attention that they deserve so yeah point well taken i think Lovely. what happens it is uh, perception of trauma yes very true but uh, yeah. uh, what is the person going through in life at that point in time that also defines that perception I means yes. uh, as he is saying the maternal uncle though he was very close to if there are other circumstances which are favorable less stressful maybe the perception of trauma would not be so much but under any different circumstances the perception of trauma would again differ and may increase or decrease that way like in that point of view yeah yeah we yeah. had a lot of doctors who told us that we become a little immune to death now with so many deaths happening it doesn't affect us i mean i i've had a doctor friend who called up and said that you know i've lost three relatives and now if i lose a fourth or a fifth relative i think ha theek hai covid tha ho gaya matlab i have become that kind of a thing i don't feel so affected now i you know he he said what a, what is your explanation for it do you think that you know i have changed as a person it is very difficult you know for me to give him an explanation at that point of time but i said maybe it's just that it's happening so much all around that you know ha theek hai i mean it's like everyone is getting a fever that death had become common you know at that point of time so uh, people just accepted it as fate ki it happened you know that was the thing yeah so there is this concept of trait vulnerability and state vulnerability right so that's something which we have to always take into account and as janvi rightly pointed out if there have been repetitive traumas then the vulnerability is a lot more and they are far more susceptible so their uh, perception of trauma is probably heightened a lot because have been repetitive assaults on their coping skills so that's there of course but then that's where you know the state has multiplied and 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 that's where the trait or part of it also comes in. so yeah okay so i would just add two things here shalini ananta has again shared her opinion that maybe someone who was not attached to the father may have more grief after the father's death because maybe. now there is no chance to find that attachment with him is yes, all these psychological uh, yes, phenomena we are aware of definitely and aditya has shared a useful link for resources i think that's a very good link and people can definitely go on the link and uh, have a look at the material on the link thank you so much ali thank you very much uh, dr avinash to suza for having a really wonderful 360 degree perspective to trauma Uh, and very comprehensive something that appeals to the biologist in us something that appeals to the psychologist in us something that appeals to the sociologist in us as well uh, and uh, yeah very very comprehensively covered and of course uh, janvi with her astute academic perspective has added a pearls of wisdom and added more value to this already fantastic talk so thank you both of you and uh, you really made this evening far more special for all of us and of course the audience without whom this whole point uh, this whole attempt is meaningless so thank you for all your valuable inputs and uh, we are grateful that you continue to be a part of this initiative and keep coming back for more and we promise to make it 
interesting for you in the future as well. And of course, thank you to Sun Pharma for their unflinching support. Uh, we uh, we try our best to try and keep interesting topics which will add value, just not with the postgraduate students, but now we are looking beyond that too. So thank you very much once again, all of you. And uh, we'll see you again next month with another interesting topic. And uh, once again, my eternal gratitude to Avinash and Janvi. Thank you so much for being one, here. One, one last thank word. you, Rashmi. Uh, one last word that, uh, you know, in the beginning you mentioned about Janvi being your registrar and you know she was my teacher of course she was a lecturer <laughs> was at KM and I always say this I don't miss a chance to say this yeah, that, I know. Yeah, you know yes so the thing is I may have any number of publications but publication number one was with her so that is very <laughs> important. Yeah. yeah that is very important do you like the, the hero number studying. one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if that didn't start it would have not continued so I mean yeah. <laughs> Good. So, Janvi, you said the ball rolling. You now got oh, it. Oh, wow. That makes me really s- feel good. <laughs> but you deserve it, don't you? No yeah. doubt. No, no, no. okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for inviting Thank me today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. For a lovely talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Wish Bye-bye. you all a good evening ahead. Thank you very Thank much, you. folks. Bye-bye. Goodbye.